Sacrament of Christ's love. Where was the first public miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ? Mentioned in the scripture. Okay. Wedding in Cana. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Do you think that was an accident? I don't buy it. No. No. He was making a very, very clear point. Now, there's a number of things you have to think about with that wedding in Cana and what was going on. He was an invited guest. Okay. We have the running out of the wine. He could have said no. He goes, I'm not really involved in this. You know, on your own. He tried to, didn't he? <laughs> well, he said to his mother, you know, my hour has not come. Yeah, we're concerned in this is mine. And different translation. But what did she say? The last recorded words of the Holy Mother of God in Scripture are the next line. Do whatever he says. Okay. He hadn't said anything that, well, I'll do it anyway. It's okay. You know, because she knew what the situation was. She knew to completely, what was that word? Trust! That her son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, would provide us the which is one of the problems that we have as a, married, uh, as a married man, is to remind myself to trust. To trust God and trust my spouse. To trust that if I truly, truly live my life and give myself fully to God and my spouse, that I will be cared for. Will it be the way I want it? Not necessarily. Will it be the way I plan? Absolutely not. Um, you know, ethnically, one side of my family is Jewish. So, there's an old uh, Jewish saying which I am very, very fond of. If you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, you know, they never worked out the way you planned, and, and that's okay. Because, after all, we have to remind ourselves, and this is true of uh, marriage. Who is in charge? And you gotta remind yourself, it's not us. And speaking as a man who is, as of this year, been married for 25 years, um, we have to let go of that notion that we're in charge and I'll, you know, get my ideas and process and take a little bit of that. Um, because that's not how God shows us. That's not what works. It also means that sometimes we have to sit down, be honest with ourselves, and work on our marriages. We work on our finances. We work on plans for vacations. We work on plans for kids going to school. We work on, you know, working on our fantasy football league. We work on planning out when we're going to go uh, tailgating for a uh, Football game. We do all this planning. We do all this work. How often do we sit down with the person that you stood before the altar of God and promised yourself to? Sit down with them and say, okay, how are things going? What am I doing wrong? What am I not doing enough of? What am I not giving you that you need? How often do we actually open our hearts and be vulnerable to the one person through God's love that we can do that with. And know that there will be a reciprocal relationship. And if there isn't, it's time to start working on that. But we don't do it. We have a tendency of drifting. It's what I refer to as the, you know, vegetable garden technique of marriage. How many of you do your gardening the way I do? <coughs> Springtime comes, you get the ground perfect. Everything is polished, everything is looking beautiful. You got it the rototill beautifully. You got the lines in the, with the seeds. You put your seedlings in. It's beautiful. And you don't leave it alone for two to three weeks. Oh, I see some hands. Okay. And then you come back, and you're about this deep in weeds. Okay? 
So now we go in there, we roll up our sleeves, and we sweat, and we toil, and we get things cleaned up, and we hope we don't up uproot what we planted a fair amount of that happens. And then we come back in two to three weeks, and it's happened again. About this stage, most of us turn our uh, vegetable beds into a monument to weeds and let it go for the rest of the season. Okay, others of us continue with this process. But interesting enough, by the way, if you look at city gardens where they have free ones that people can you know, take part in, they state that about 85% of people drop out before harvest time. Mm -hmm. It's work. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not particularly glamorous work, let's be honest. It's fun to do the starting part, but you know, it's, I mean, it's all along. Marriage can be a long way of life that. We spend a lot of time doing the prep. We get everything ready. We spend enormous amounts of money, time, and energy on the wedding. But how much do we do on the marriage? You know, do we ever stop and say, you know, this is something that I've been investing my entire life in. It would be a good idea for me to sit down and work with it. Talk to my spouse. What an odd concept. And actually find out how things are going. We don't do it. Partly because we don't remember that this is a sacrament given to us by God. We think about ourselves. Well, actually, let's be honest with ourselves, we think about ourselves. And we don't think necessarily about the other person, and we're certainly not thinking about what does God want me to do as a married person? What are my responsibilities? I know what my gifts are. There's quite a lot of them. But what am I supposed to be giving in return? We have a tendency of dropping out a lot. Foundation of the family and society. Well, right now, there's a lot of debate. And there's a lot of noise going on on whether we should have, you know, other options in marriage. Okay. This is a very difficult thing to say. Because you don't want to be, in this 21st century, you don't want to be judgmental, you don't want to be all these other things that people will beat you up for. But it's much like dealing with your children. If your kids come to you and say, well, you know, Dad, I really think that doing, oh, I don't know, LSD would be a good thing for me to do because it would make me happy, most of us would have the common sense that God gave a carrot and say, I don't care if you think that's a good idea, you'll destroy yourself. No. But I want to be happy. That's not happiness. You may think it is. But in the long run, it is not what will make you truly happy. What makes you truly happy is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's real happiness. What we're talking about is having fun. And in the 21st century in the United States, the worst thing you can tell anybody is they can't have fun. Okay. In whatever fashion, you, whichever configuration we're looking at. And by the way, hold on tight, if you think the limitations of configurations have shown up, no, they're not. There will be a lot more. It's going to get much more complicated. Okay? Because they always do. Remember what the Holy Father said back when contraception was first started being discussed about what this was going to do to our society. And guess what? He was right. This is the same sort of situation. We assume that, well, this is as far as it's going to go. No, it's not. There will be further developments, and things will get much more complicated and much more difficult if this continues on. The point is, is that marriage is instituted by God for us, for our good. It is not a human construction. And that is really where the big problems come in. And it's through the family that you have a stable society. If you have unstable situations, it damages society. We only have to look what has happened in the 20th century with families and the results it has had with adults as they grow to see where this, is, where this happens. You know, this is not rocket science. This is not something theoretical. We can look at this from very, very solid notions of what has happened to people. It's, it's, Deadly destructive. 
It's been pointed out that, and this is very odd, but it's an absolute fact. From a point of view of the growth of a person, it is easier for a child to get over the death of a parent than over divorce. They have less long-term damage socially from the death of a parent than from the divorce. And that's, that is amazing when you first run across that. And the numbers on that are very, very clear. And it really comes down to this idea of a permanent covenant. Okay. But at the same time, we have to be constantly working on improving this. How many of us talk to our children about what dating is about? Why do we date? In the 21st century in the United States, what is the purpose of dating? To meet different people. To meet different people. To look for a spouse. To look, that would be the proper answer, look for a spouse. <laughs> now, let's see the answer is more than utmost honest, to have fun. Right? Okay. Um, to have fun. The problem is, this notion of having fun is not in the original concept of what was going on with dating. You were looking for someone to spend your life with. I'll give you a personal example of something that happened in my own life. When I was in, uh, at school at Kent State, um, it went in graduate school, I had a close friend of mine who was an Orthodox Jew. And someone asked him, well, one time I was sitting at the table, why he didn't date. And he says, well, there's not many Orthodox Jewish girls in the area. And he says, well, you can date a Gentile. He says, no, I can't. If I do, I could fall in love with her. If I do that, I cannot marry her. Because I will be married to an Orthodox Jewish woman. That's what's going to happen. So why put myself through that pain and hurt someone else? Well, I know that relationship will never happen. He had a very healthy notion of what was going on in his life. He had thought it through and said, this is what my goal is, and this is how I'm going to get there. Unfortunately, most of our, the young people today have not thought through at all what they're going to date. They date because they want to have fun. They want to meet someone else, do something different, go see things, all the stuff that goes with it. They haven't really sat down and thought about what is it that we're trying to do. Now, here's the second question. As parents, how many have ever spoke to them about what the purpose of dating was about? Did you ever sit down and say, by the way, you're going to start dating soon. Do you have any idea why? What are you out there for? What's going on? Most of us don't. This is what happens when they turn a certain age. You know, and the time for dating, I, I won't get involved in that question. Um, no, thank you. There's enough landmines for me around me. I don't need to start adding ones into the picture. Um, but it's a question that really is a valid one to start thinking about, and we don't. There's so many of our cultural assumptions that may not really line up with Christianity, and we don't think about them, because that's how we do it. Americans, when we're in high school at some point, we start dating. No one ever asks the question, why? What are you looking for? Yeah. What's the criteria that you're using other than they have a pulse? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what exactly is involved here? We don't do it. And partly, let's be honest with ourselves, because of us as parents, not necessarily asking those questions. Because the thing is, they never occur to us. Because we haven't sat down and started thinking about, what is it, what's going on here? Now, 